Rebecca. Uh, today will be about multiple sequence alignments. Just one other announcement. I don't know what's wrong with that slide. Uh, I do not know about June 3rd. I may have to skip the lecture on June 3rd. So last time was about 3D comparison. Today is about alignments and the reach in some sense comparative modeling and then we will continue on alignments. Again, the notion, so the words 3D, 2D, 1D, string, 2D is completely the same sort of information in the sense that other than its mirror image you can reproduce once you have the full distance map you can reproduce the 3D structure. Well, 1D no longer contains the full information. Uh, sequence comparison pairwise methods, what do we try to do? We try to align proteins, so essentially it's a simple alignment of, of words and when you look at this you well one thing that stands out the meaning of that one is father um, and then what stands out that the meaning of this is something else um, and then what stands out to some people at least uh, is that there are three who have a similar meaning uh, with three different lang in three different languages here uh, and in fact they are aligning so I guess that for every of these, or for most of these words, there, at least for two of these three words, there's somebody in the room who understands them. Um, the third one, French. Um, so this is the same meaning. That, oops, uh, there is an A, I dropped an A. So if that would imagine an A here, uh, then that is the father. So somehow this is still right in the alignment, in the sense alignment, this is wrong. And so there's one way of aligning that just aligns these words and another one that makes sense out of it. And that in fact says, this one is not to be aligned here because it doesn't belong. And this one is in fact, although in terms of the mer sequence identity would be further removed, in fact, in terms of reasonability, reason or sense, this belongs here. This is sort of, if that would be a protein, it's a word, family, it's a family. This is sort of a related family, father or father, uh, but this doesn't belong. And that, all of these tricks alignments have to do. In order to do that, we have to somehow find the optimal superposition and to define what optimal is. There are two different ways. You all know about that global local, as in I begin at the beginning, I end at the end, or I find fragments in between to align. The biological meaning of insertion is in fact an additional typical uh, loop kind of region that was put on top. The historical interpretation of alignments or sequence comparisons anyway is evolution. And that has to do with the word homology. The uh, homology now comes back, goes back to phylogeny. And phylogeny comes originally from this single figure in the 1859 origin of species from Darwin, Tree of Life. That is the origin of species, as Darwin saw it. One tree, essentially, it's not that defined, it's not one tree, but essentially the, the tree of relations here. And homology is defined over this tree. Just today's tree of life looks more like this, bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes, or like this, uh, similar version, just more, more data in here. That is a zoom into the one before. If I compare these two and zoom into the comparison, then I see that in fact there are different interpretations here how we root this tree. Okay? Uh, bacteria, sort of, uh, bacteria and archaebacteria, do they have a common ancestor? And then sort of both go off to uh, archaea, or is it the other way around? Is there a sort of common ancestor to all three kingdoms? Uh, the prevalent work that has sort of happened over the last 20 years is that archaea and bacteria are sort of one big group. Anyway, those are details. Back to the idea of, of homology. Back, that brings us to the idea of speciation. Speciation events are when you, in fact, group a different species. Originally, uh, mologos, homologos, uh, is meaning to have the same organ, Richard Owen, in different animals. Today, in terms of the number of the gene, the definition is you have a common ancestor. Okay, there's a, def a sequence that derived before speciation of the common ancestor. That's the definition of homology. Then there's, there's sort of an additional definition here. Orthology is in fact the corresponding protein, so we have a common ancestor, goes off into two species. The protein does the same in these two species. That's an ortholog. 
Then we have an example where you have a duplication of a gene after the speciation event. So inside of a species, yeast does something like that uh, every day. Uh, those are paralogs. And typically those are thought to be the playground for evolution. So you know you have already a protein A that does function A, and now you make a copy of it. Since you don't know, don't have to do A anymore, you can sort of vary the other one a little bit, A prime, and this variation may allow you to do something else with it. That is the idea how or one one mechanism by which we assume that we have evolved new functions, new proteins. Um, again, those are paralogs. Homology defined through the common ancestor. That again brings us back to the species. So the idea of a species, how are species defined? Uh, yes, <laughs> you predicted uh, the outcome of this. Now, since you said that, actually it's not quite that way. Uh, so mating, let's add to the word a little bit. So there are different definitions of the word mating. Um, one definition of the word mating, and that is the one that applies here, is you also have offspring that in fact can have further offspring. Uh, sometimes people would not would assume there could be mating without offspring, so in, in strange relations of life. Uh, but anyway, so that, that is the biological definition. So the way it sort of works is, you, you know, they, you have these fruit flies, they're happily munching on, on some bananas, and you know, there's a beautiful island, everything is cool, but suddenly there's a flood. And now the problem is that on the other side of the island, no more banana trees. So this other group that sort of went over there has to now munch on some other, uh, fruit and they, you know, diverge, and that's not good because now, since they diverge, different propensities, different mating preferences, different food leads to different mating preferences. Ultimately, leads to different species. That's sort of the idea how it evolves. There are problems. So, like always in biology, sort of, is this uh, happy face spider? Is it the same species? Uh, they uh, or not, this a similar story here with the carrion hooded crow, are these the same species? They are hybrids that in fact have uh, children. We all, I assume, know that all of the people in the room have Neanderthal gene in them. In fact, to, uh, to 4%, depending on where you're from, so I, looking around, I assume we all have in the ballpark of 2%. Uh, that means, essentially, we have an example right there that interbreeding happened and that interbreeding had uh, lots of offsprings, ultimately. Uh, so there's another sort of violation of the rule, the concept of, of species. Back to the gene. So the gene homology means uh, the gene from a common ancestor. Often, in papers, what you will find is homologous structures, homologous function. And that actually just means similar from the definition of the word to stanzens. Okay? The other aspect of it that I want to uh, take your attention to, homology is a concept. I have a common ancestor. The common ancestor has a duplication of a gene before the speciation event. As long as I have the entire history of evolution for all the proteins of all, this, of, of all the organisms that ever lived, this is reality and I can measure it. Since I don't have that, this is a construct, right? Most of the evolutionary history will always most likely remain unclear. So this really is a concept. It's nothing we can really measure. While structural similarity or functional similarity that we can establish. Structural similarity, we talked about it last week. You simply superpose the two, you look at the RMSD, there are other way, ways to measure similarity, but that is a, a scientifically measurable thing. Homology is not. So homology essentially is a misnomer. But still, historically the interpretation for the, interpret for the comparison of sequences is there's an evolutionary relation between them. Dynamic programming, we talked about it last week, is essentially brute force approach. Uh, there are visual approaches, bless you, uh, visual approaches and now, so again, uh, many people align sequences visually. That 
there are exam many examples where in fact they first use machines and then they improve the alignments by just moving sequences on a, on a whiteboard, on a screen with computers. There are many ways of doing it, but really there are many people who align thousands of sequences. For instance, virologists are, is a typical example because the um, methods are just not good enough. For if you dig down into, you have your life spent on one particular virus, then you know better than these methods, okay? Uh, but Niederman Wunsch is the first idea to really formalize that and come up with a method to do it automatically. That is in the 70s, so 69, that's just after a decade in which have, people have begun to compare the first sequences. You may go back that the Sanger sequencing started in the 50s, Fred Sanger started this protein sequencing, so in the 60s we just have a bunch of sequences and people begin to in fact compare them. I will go back to one of these examples in a moment. And at that moment, actually to come up with a mathematical method that would do it is really looking much, much ahead into the future. And again, this is the straightforward way. You, t you want to align the second sequence into the first, you move it around, you try all possible ways of doing that, mathematically formalized, you have a matrix, sequence one, sequence two, you just go walk around the uh, diagonal and you try all of these. Leaving that diagonal you can by allowing gaps, so allowing for gaps here would allow you to go to three or here in this particular case to four and get the best trace. Just trace back, that's the way the algorithm works and find then your optimal alignment. Sometimes there is no one optimal alignment, that's a, a matrix plot, a dot plot that shows essentially all of these visualized for a larger protein and you see there is no clear path through it. There are local densities and there are alternative paths. These dot plots sometimes tell you a lot about alternative alignments and typically uh, the assumption is when we have alternative alignments and we cannot decide whether the one or the other is true, then we have cases where it doesn't matter really. In reality often that is not the case. So in the reality one of the alternatives that the method cannot distinguish clearly is better than the other in terms of the biology. Uh, the other issue here Linear gap penalty, so in this whole idea, the gap means you give a penalty. A linear gap penalty means that these two are completely equivalent in terms of the value. However, Stephen Hennikoff, Jorge Hennikoff have observed, or many people have observed, but they were the first to formalize that, that in fact, when you line sequences, of, then you typically observe something like that, meaning protein one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the interpretation again, we had talked about that, we would have here two different domains. And gaps are likely longer, that's much less likely than this. Also, in terms of the 3D interpretation of a gap, a gap is a loop that you put on top. A loop of one residue doesn't work. Uh, that would be lifting it a little bit, certainly in a helix less likely. Uh, so more than one is the more likely scenario. And they use that to, in fact, uh, the, oh, let, let's go back how we put this into the method, so that is my Needleman Wunsch score. How can I put the idea of blocks into it? Using an affine gap penalty. How do I do that? Punish, punish gap opening and don't punish gap extensions as well. Uh, yes, I have, in fact, that, that, so I have another term here. Uh, that I'll show you in a minute, the gap uh, extension, gap penalty, gap open, gap extension, and typically this is 10 times smaller. Don't punish is a, is a strong word, but make it somehow smaller. Uh, now this is in fact here the entire curve uh, uh, formula, and now we go also from global to local alignments, because in fact the reality is we, we have typically matches of sh short fragments, or shorter fragments than the entire proteins. Uh, and then we have essentially the dynamic programming formulation here. The big difference between Needleman Wunsch and Smith Waterman is that for Needleman Wunsch we can mathematically define any function you can throw it as, as an objective function, so as the goal. This is the mathematically proven correct solution, while as long as soon as you go for local, you can no longer prove that. So you get a good solution maybe the best you will ever get or something like that, but you will certainly not get the solution that is mathematically guaranteed to be right. Uh, objective function. So you optimize the score so far, what I implicitly always talked about were identical residues matches. Now, can you throw any objective function at this thing? Is there any assumption 
in my dynamic programming. The, the main assumption is that um, um, the next match is, uh, or if, if the next match is good or not, can be, um, um, what's the word? The local environment does play a role. So does or doesn't? No. So the, 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 you're right, except for minus one. Uh, so when you look at uh, re residues i and j, the assumption of, of Smith Waterman and, uh, or Needleman Wunsch is they're independent. So the alignment at i has nothing to do with the alignment at j, and that is for every i and j in a, in a sequence. So local environments do not count. In reality, we know this is not true. Okay, but every method that is currently all the alignment methods that are currently being used have that assumption. So we will get uh, next week into DHMMs a little bit. That is I and I plus one are related, but other, everything else is, is statistically independent still. There are methods that align regions that consider what the biological reality is. There are relations, um, but they are not really uh, being, being used, uh, partially due to the complexity or the time that is required for those methods. There is a way to do dynamic programming that in fact would bring in a relation, so-called double dynamic programming, introduced by Willie Taylor, but once again, um, Willie Taylor, it is, I briefly talked about it in the context of structural alignment. Uh, it also, you can also use that for sequence alignment. But other than that, this is the, the assumption. So again, as long as the objective function does not introduce a correlation between i and j, any objective function is optimized by that. OK, uh, now we have an, another issue. The moment we go needle, uh, Smith Waterman, we go local, we have the issue of deciding. So in this particular case here, I would have two residues and I have a 100% match. If I extended the alignment, I would have a match of 4 and 7. What is better? Right? So on the one hand, 100 sounds good, 100% accuracy or 100% identity sounds very good. On the other hand, 2 is a very, very short alignment. And there is no clear way to answer that. I'll get back to this in a, little, in a minute. But there is no simple way, in fact, to answer that. How could you imagine to address the issue? of which of these two is better. So one, again, this is the raw uh, Smith-Waterman score, not subtracting the gaps in this particular case. Um, so you could argue that this raw score is better. That would always give you the longer alignments, right? Because it's simply, as long as you can add something, you will add something until you will have no more. But in this case, uh, if, if you use this score, then that is the answer. So what other ways could you imagine to in fact address the issue? What is better? But is the solution not the gap penalty and the mismatch? No, not really. So again, uh, no. So you don't get out with that because just assume I had in fact done the same, I could have easily imagined two sequences where without gaps we would have the same problem. Okay, so the gaps would subtract a little bit. So uh, I don't know, the, the gap penalty is typically uh, smaller than one. So we have in this particular case here three gaps. So whatever, it may be, well actually it depends on how much smaller than one it is. Okay, you got me there. Uh, I have a gap penalty of 0.5. So 3 times 0.5 is less than that difference, so this would still be the better one. Let's say just take um, other sequences in the same length, yeah. random, and look if it's... That's a great idea. We will get back to that. That's exactly the fast A Bill Pearson idea, to, to look at how significant that hit is with respect to random. And that is a very, very important one, and we'll get to back to that. Uh, but here's another issue, that is the substitution matrix. You all know that just met, met, matching letters is not the best thing to do. Example here is the potassium channel. Uh, these two proteins, when you align them, 
That's, the, that's one alignment where the identical residues are in this row in between the two. Overall, uh, the, 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 the sequence identity is in the ballpark of 60%. Now, in, in this ochreish color, uh, those three residues here, you may see, I'm sorry uh, if it is not clear enough, that's AI. E, e. Oh, you, you see in the middle that only one of these three, so, sorry, back up. Those mark the sensitivity filter of this potassium channel. This is importantly conserved functionally because these two things do the same thing from these two species. Uh, now, that's remarkable because only one in those three residues is identical. Yet, they, in fact, so overall, the level of sequence identity is 60%. So here I have one in three, which is much less than the overall level. And that yet is functionally the very, very important region. And that immediately makes you realize that identity matching is not all there is to it. There must be something better. You know about scoring matrices. And historically, the first idea, it's not really an idea here to, to develop scoring matrices. Uh, Margaret Dayhoff tried to, in fact, understand evolution. Created the PUM point accepted mutations matrix. She did that by manually, visually aligning 1700, 1,572 mutations in 71 families. Uh, she did all these alignments and then defined matrices that are such that PEM1 is one point mutation per 100 comparisons. PEMN is the same by the power of n. So PEM5 is not five uh, point mutations, mind you, because that is often misused. It's all history because nobody in their right mind uses PEM anymore. Um, but this is uh, at the heart of, of, of using sequences, all the sequences out there to understand evolution and putting some mathematical formula around it. And at the time Margaret Dayoff did this, this was really, really much ahead in time. Uh, very visionary work. Now, the next step in that direction has been done by Rocha Hennikov and Stephen Hennikov. You see Stephen because I can nowhere find a picture of Rocha. And I respect that to mean that she doesn't want to show any, so that they're married. Uh, and the idea here is to take the blocks that you get from uh, aligning proteins. So now what you do is you take a bunch of proteins, you use percentage sequence identity, so what we know is not good, to identify things that you want to look at. 62%, for instance, we find everything that is within 62% of pairwise sequence identity. We put that in a pot, align it, find blocks. Blocks are defined as things that have no insertion in them. And now in all of these blocks, I compile these log odds. So for every single column, I look at what residue is mutated against what other residue, what amino acid against what other amino acid, and I look at the probability of randomly having this, observing this mutation, and that defines my log odds ratio. The log odds ratio is translated into a scoring matrix. Here, the blossom 62, and there are a couple of features of the matrix. For instance, at the diagonal, you see E on E and W on W give very, very different values. Alanine on alanine is only much smaller. So that's the first observation. Matching the same residue is not always the same. It depends on who you are. Tryptophan is a functionally very important residue. Uh, e is, a, is also important in terms of the biophysical charge. This is more important. And alanine is sort of can be uh, replaced against anything. That is somehow the idea. Uh, in particular, if you look at uh, some, some other residue here, uh, leucine uh, it reaches at least with valine the same as, as alanine, alanine, but uh, the two positively charged residue lysine K and R arginine here are higher as a match than the alanine alanine match. And then there are negative numbers where things are not helpful to be aligned. So that's sort of like another penalty. Now you plug in that matrix into the Smith Waterman and everything proceeds as, as it was before. The 80s and 90s saw the development of a bunch of uh, matrices, but today I believe really the one that comes through is Blossom, 
with, a, with an exception that I'll get back to in a minute. Uh, Gournay, McLaughlin, Claverie are three types of matrices that all had their advantages. Most of these, McLaughlin and uh, Gournay clearly also had a li little bit of a different math underneath. Uh, but most of those simply differ in the way you select the first set of sequences that you then use to compile the logouts. Okay? Uh, and FAT and SLIM are two ways of, of compiling the logouts based on residues that are in membrane regions. Okay? So, just, you know, that's typical science. FAT and SLIM are the closest competitor to each other. Uh, that explains the word. And now, if you gave a seminar only on fat, and then you would explain why fat is called fat, and you would certainly, you certainly would find a reason for that, and for slim too. But sometimes you see the bigger picture and you see that it almost becomes nonsense. Here's a couple of other things that are also derived based on similarity in structures. Some people do matrices based on functional similarities, and this again is typically based on structural features and many, many others. But again, the standard tool that people use today is Blossom. Uh, in different implements, 62 is for the pairs being 62, 35, and so forth. There's a nice tool to play around with the way uh, dynamic programming works, done by Francesco Mello. Uh, one the problem with the dynamic program is the time that it takes. It's, uh, the speed is proportional to the square of the length. And it's tough to do this for today's sequences. Uh, and there's an issue about how to choose the parameters. It's gap open, gap elongation, and which, which, which matrix to choose. Again, today we sh essentially mostly use the blossom matrices, so that part is less, less of a problem. But then there are gap open and gap elongation penalties to be chosen. There are default choices, but they are not best for all families. And typically it's expected of you as a user, not as a developer of a program in this particular case, uh, to find the best choice. Cluster W, I'll get back to that in a minute, not in a minute, next week. Uh, provides various choices that are somehow dependent on what they find locally. Okay, how can we speed up? We speed up by hashing, you all know that. So hashing is we simply, simply compare with words that we want to match. In this particular case, we have words of length three, and then we extect, extend the word match by, for instance, dynamic programming. Why is that speeding it up? Word search is fast, that's clear. But why would it help me to do dynamic programming extension, although this is still dynamic programming and slow? Because I'm doing it in a much uh, smaller portion of the protein. It's in the square of the length, so just halving you, you sort of have one fourth of the time. Uh, and mostly you find many words to match. In fact, uh, do you assume that if you assume that you would really look at word size of three and you would create all possible words of three what's the probability that in today's database you find a hit yeah one so the probability yeah you did. <laughs> yes that's a correct answer, right? So uh, three, the possibility is 20 times 20 times 28,000. We have 55 million sequences. So it's almost guaranteed that, that every triplet is in there. I'm not entirely sure. I believe it is really every triplet in there. Um, and some are underrepresented and they are typically low complexity letters, but that's a different story. Uh, what this method does not tell you is what you do in between. Again, that's something that you leave to the user to figure out what the in-between means. Uh, the original approach to speed up by hashing comes from Fast A, from Bill Pearson. Uh, five years later comes Blast, uh, from the director of NCBI, David Lipman, Stephen Altschul, Webb Miller, Eugene Myers, Tom Madden, Alejandro Schaefer, Eugene also brought you not only part of BLAST, but also GREP, that some of you may use, um, and many other things. He's now working on imaging of, of fly brains. Actually, he, he currently he joined, he's in Dresden in the Max Planck Institute now. Um, uh, 
sure why, why I put this slide in. The major challenge in this issue for the word search is to establish statistical significance. How would I do that? She said it already, yeah. So essentially you look at some background, uh, you look at the hits you find, so not homologs. Uh, the statistical significance has to do with three values. One is the width of that distribution, one is the average of that distribution, and one is the distance of the actual finds that you have. How do you create this? By something or... By something. That is, a, <laughs> that is an up... <laughs> By sampling, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> or, um, or you make some assumptions? No, no, but, but I, I wanted to, what do you mean by sampling? Be more precise. Or let's have somebody else. Uh, you can permutate the sequences. Yes. And you know that, that somebody is doing that? Have you presented a method? Have you done a seminar in which you, you pre uh, presented that? Uh, in some exercises. What else could you do? So you could just permute, permute sequences. Anything else? Because permutation still takes time. You have to create them. A sampling, whatever you do in terms of sampling, does take time too. Yeah? You could just take, uh, just make new sequences out of the background. Yeah, that's sort of sampling, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's also, it's also uh, 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 permutation and sampling in that sense both would be on a similar time scale. How could you speed up? I think they, um, they did the math, they yes. simulated it. Just, it just yes, you can theoretically somehow, or in, in, a, in an experiment, sort of given the amino acid distribution, can just compile the background once and for all. And then for every data search, it will be the same thing. Uh, and that is, in fact, the BLAST approach to have a pre-compiled version. Historically, the fast A approach that you described with the permutation is the one that is way more accurate. Today, BLAST has added a lot without losing speed to improve the statistics. Uh, and they have done this pre-compilation in a way that is so good that essentially they are, they are as good as fast A now at a much, much faster uh, alignment. How accurate are pairwise alignments? Before I go into that, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, uh, do similar sequences have similar function? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Oops. Uh, and the same is true for structure, but actually not the same. This relation here is more likely than that relation. Now, in terms of sequence space, so all the proteins uh, of uh, all the proteins and their structure space, all the structure, structure space is smaller. So different sequences here map to different structures. These things map to different structures. Uh, similar sequences map to similar structures. Most sequences, and now this is sequence space, so all possible. Uh, there was somebody with the idea that, I'm sorry, I, I forgot who, with the idea to, and I forgot the, the photo of you guys, uh, to in fact, simulate, you were the one, right? You simulate all possible sequences, uh, randomly create sequences, and that's what I mean here in terms of sequence space. This is all possible sequences. Most sequences don't exist. We, I argue, but that may be wrong, uh, I argue most sequences will never be seen because they will, in fact, not fold to anything. They will not map into structure space. Um, but at this point, that remains an assumption. There is a, one, we, we assume there is a safe zone of doing pairwise comparison, safe zone meaning that whatever I do, I essentially find the right alignment. And then there is a twilight zone. So the numbers down here, we will talk about later. The term twilight zone comes from Russ Doolittle, and the idea again is I lose the signal, okay? Everything is simple here, and I'm beginning to lose the signal here. And then there is a midnight zone. And the idea of a midnight zone is essentially you have no signal whatsoever. It's dark. Okay? Uh, and that term actually comes from me. Uh, anyway, so 
the idea of the twilight zone is here illustrated and this is not uh, it's just an illustration it's not true data uh, you come from some high level sequence identity and you don't make a mistake here from 100 to 40 is the, the, the accuracy and then you slowly begin to make a mistake and lose the signal okay that somewhere here is the twilight zone you begin to lose the signal um, but how could you essentially establish the performance of alignment methods and the idea of groups is that you form somehow groups of in this particular case uh, the gentleman in the back has to sort of distribute himself to to, to either side of the room uh, these two these two these two these three and you you find your your group uh, I'll, I'll leave you two minutes and you answer how can we assess alignment methods so far so the assessment of alignment method just to make that clear the answer is not by statistical ways anymore because that is what we want to assess how well do our statistical significance tests work how well is blast how, how well does dynamic programming work I'll give you two minutes for that okay time up uh, I'd like each pr each group to, pr to, to present their solution <laughs> whoever wants to start My name is <laughs> yeah. So obviously that group in the back starts. <laughs> we start? Yeah. Yeah, you said that somebody else has to start first. So that makes you a perfect candidate. Okay. Uh, well, mostly we don't have a clue. But um, the two best ideas were, um, um, I mean, accuracy, you compare it to something you know is true. So we define um, we did define the results of dynamic programming as true because we know them to be mathematically correct at the least, or with um, with make. Um, but this way you cannot assess dynamic programming. Okay, number two, approach number two. Or with um, with create um, uh, in in the uh, like following the example of, of uh, Mrs. Dayhoff, we just manually align uh, sequences. Um, make this big uh, alignment data set and then compare it to this one. Okay. So take this as a standard. So how long, how long, how many do you believe you can do if you do your master thesis or you're, you're working on this? I'm guessing somewhere around two or three thousand at the most. Okay. So that's approach number one. Next one. So we're not really sure about it because we uh, just talked about pairwise alignments, but in cases, um, well, we could do multiple alignments, we could have kind of... No, we, we, I, uh, the, the, yes, we can make it more complicated. Uh, so we can try to solve a problem by making it more complicated. Typically, the scientific approach is to avoid that and to, in fact, see, we, we hope that we can reduce problems to simpler problems that we then can solve. That's what we are. That's what I'm hunting for. Can we find something? So not not no pairwise. So do we have, do we have a solution for pairwise? Two. Number three. <laughs> Whichever wants to go first. Did you really have anything? We thought about. Oh come on! Then we then we cannot vote on who, who, who what is the top solution. First, we talk about like how is the accuracy then defined? Because yeah, we were, that's a great point. You're going to talk about that later. Yeah. But first, I, I'll bring up the but, group but story to again. To improve that, we would have to know how it is defined because yeah. Yeah. Uh. it's alignment Yeah, no, but that's my question. Where do you get correct alignments from? So again, let's. Yeah, but let, you know what the correct one is. No, you don't know, but you should come. You should tell me how I could find some, or how you could find some. Uh, okay, manual, two thousand wins simply because there is no competitor. Uh, this is weak. Come on, this this lecture is about structure, and we talked about structure comparison. And the reason why we talked about structure comparison is so that you can give me the answer here. Uh, the answer is you begin with a set of proteins of known structure. You do a sequence alignment. You take that set and you do a structural comparison and then you have something that you may in many ways call an objective truth because this truth here has nothing to do with that. 
clearly one goal for sequence alignment is to create things that imply structural similarity. And how well you do that is clearly measured by that. How well you reproduce structural alignments. Now, all versus all. Uh, there is a little bit of a caveat here. So there is sort of two angstrom main chain atom RMSD or whatever. Uh, I know that two proteins are related if they are closer than that. If they're over five, I know they're not. They're not, and in between there's something that I can't say. I throw that part out, right? So that, that's a little bit of an additional thing. Uh, is it okay to do an all against all now? Any, anybody can imagine anything that speaks against it? Well, sometimes uh, I think the 3D structure of proteins um, on the crystallization and stuff like that. So oh, that's a good point. Oh, that's a, that's a great point. We will get back to that. Um, yes, but let's, I, I take that point. But assume, um, assume we, 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 assume we could, clear. my entire PDB from here on is the one where I filter out mistakes. That's an important point. We have subtracted that. Now the question comes, is there still an issue? Are we talking practical issues or theoretical issues here? So, would time be a problem? Oh, oh that's what you mean. No. No, that's not a problem. Great. I cannot answer your question. Uh, but the second question is not about CPU time here. Okay. Well, there, there are not all structures known? So no, that is tr absolutely true. But what I'm asking is, can I take all the ones throwing away that have a mistake uh, and compare all against all? Is there anybody seeing a problem in that? I want somebody to see a problem. Before, before you see a problem, I don't move on. Let's say take different structures and compare all which have the same structure. Not structure with another structure. Uh, be careful, I need to, oops, I imagine, oh, <laughs> sorry, uh, so I need the things that don't match, otherwise I never get an accuracy. So that I cannot do. But the question again is, is it okay to do filtering out mistakes, you're totally right about that. Is it okay to use the entire PDP? I claim no. And you have to tell me why am I right in claiming no? Maybe because there are some families overrepresented? Exactly, why? Why? Be yeah, because they're, for example, MHC or something, they're... Um, MAC. Mac. So you mean computers? MHC. <laughs> oh, MHC. <laughs> Major <laughs> stability <laughs> complex. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, MHC, yeah. So yeah, they are very common. They're, they're, they're in, yeah, they're in diseases and they are. So we have to, yeah? Crystallized. And to some um, structures, it's easier to, to get a uh, crystal structure, yeah, because they are small and it's so what we have to, in fact, separate out here, and to some extent your question that you had before is, is bringing that into complication. The situation where I have many structures because you have many proteins of that type, and MHC could be of that type, yeah. uh, Tim Barrels could be of that type, and there are others, uh, antibodies, and the case where, in fact, what I see is not a representation of what is in my body, or in, in terms of percentages, but it's just a representation of what is easier to be done. Or, in fact, so you bring a very positive way of, of uh, arguing for bias. There's a, there's a much, in some sense, you may call that more negative, but again, it's, it's not negative in any way. But a negative for establishing a truth and assessing alignment methods, a negative reality would be if somebody did another structure of a similar structure of a similar protein only because it's cheaper to do. So you get maybe not the science structure of the uh, receptor, that, uh, the, the channel that I showed before, the potassium channel, but you get a PNAS paper if you do another bacterium. And that is, scientifically, these structures are very, very important. 
Uh, and it's completely understandable that other groups do this, but in terms of assessing the accuracy, that would mean that certain families that are done simply because they are easier, because of whatever other reason that is more social, are overcounted, and we have to avoid that. So that means, yeah? Uh, but don't we have the sequences to each of the structures? Yes. So we could do some kind of stratification to equal out the balance? Exactly. We could look at a sequence unique subset, take that sequence unique subset, and compare it against all. We cannot do sequence unique against sequence unique because then we cannot assess alignment methods that cannot align things that are so far apart. Because sequence unique, by definition, there's no pair in here that I can align by blast, so I can no longer check out how good blast is. So that's why I have to bring bias at least on one side, but I don't square the bias. So having done that, Chris Sander and Reinhard Schneider uh, in 1999 published the HSSP curve. The HSSP curve here, number of residues aligned, percentage sequence identity. Let's not dwell too long on it because uh, the data set was too small. It was uh, corrected later. The gray curve shows this, but the idea is the same. So you have number of residues aligned versus percentage sequence identity. So the answer of what is in a relative end level is not answered by sequence identity alone, but by a trade-off between these two. The curve they had was such that pairs above that line had similar structures. Here are the real points. Blue, pairs of proteins that have similar structures. Red, those that don't. There is, yeah, oops, I went one too fast. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yep. Uh, so there, there is something wrong with this area below here. So the fact that there are no points is, is a mistake in the way the data is collected. And that cannot be fixed easily. But now back to the issue. Uh, you see lots of blue points below. But the point is to find a curve that is such that above you almost see no red points. Okay, you see a lot of red points. The trouble here is that, and I'll show you the data a little bit later, you don't see the density really. The density is not high and you may already sort of suspect that you see a little bit more blue here. Uh, but you, maybe you could visually in fact sort of change the line a little bit. But you, you would see that there is a line that would make it such that there is almost no red above. Let's just look at the example of the potassium channel again. The potassium channel has, in, in this particular alignment, has 35% sequence identity over 150 that is above the curve, while another alignment uh, would make it 40% identity and over 50 residues and that is below. So 40% is less good than 35% percent in this particular case. Length makes a difference and you can in this particular case, remember I posed this, this, this issue previously in the Smith-Waterman, uh, here you have some answer to that question what is better. But we still get to the issue of how we define accuracy uh, and how we measure accuracy and this time we don't do groups. Um, but what I'm going to show you now are curves that are distance with respect to this curve. So I will show you minus 5, minus 10, plus 5, plus 10, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Let's begin here. Uh, this is just number of, uh, number of the positives. And that is, in fact, um, the title is slightly misleading. Again, blue is the pairs of proteins that have similar structures. I, the data is compiled by the distance from the HSP curve, so the dark blue here is the HSP curve, plus means above, higher similarity, minus means below, lower similarity. These numbers here just illustrate the, the value for a certain length in the alignment, and that certain length in the alignment, 25, uh, is for about 100, I don't know, 150 residues of 200. I don't remember how, how this was plotted. Uh, but the important point you see is that coming from that side here where things appear to be relatively okay to going into less sequence identity, you have an explosion by more than a factor of 10 of the positives. 
So that means you actually really want to get here. You want to find proteins that have similar structure. Stopping here, you would leave out a lot. That's what the blue one says. The red one shows you the mistakes. And the red one, essentially, somewhere here, you start without a mistake. That is this defining the safe zone. And that immediately also shows you now how the previous plots that I showed you really do not reveal the density. Uh, the line is here. Okay, there, there are some, but not that many. Now, what you see in terms of uh, the scale here, you go by five orders of magnitude in the red one. One and a half in the blue, but five in the red. That's the signal that you're fighting against. That's why, in fact, intruding into the twilight zone is so complicated. Now the question is, how do you imagine this in a protein structure? Why? Why is there, in physics, you would call that a phase transition. It's a very rapid transition. Why? What is the feature in a protein that makes that happen? Do you believe it has to do with proteins? Or is it a feature of sequence comparisons? I'd say um, proteins that um, keep the same structure are, um, are divergently evolving in, on a sequence level. That is correct. That's, uh, sorry, that's what we assume, yes. And um, in, in, in the same, uh, in the same um, style, there are proteins that seem to converge on this sequence. Um, that you're, you're, you're giving us a lot of sort of statements that many people would call valid. But are you going to get to the answer? I guess not. Anybody? So one way in which we imagine that in terms of the biophysical uh, is that, for instance, you have a helix. You have I, and I plus 4 binding, and so you have certain sequence preference, and now you change this to something that doesn't bind uh, anymore. Let me try it with a simple helix. So you have the, the hydrogen bond here, the hydrogen bond, and now I'm already in trouble with my skills. Uh, oops, down there. Uh, so assume that I break one hydrogen bond. And I would still have the next, and somehow the helix still holds, right? So I can make individual mutations, and I can compensate for them. I can maybe put another residue that, that could bring a hydrogen bond. And I can do this for a while, but at some point, I'm going to break essential connections, and boom, I no longer have the same fold. The whole thing falls apart. That is, in some sense, the biophysical explanation. You break, you can move around bonds, but suddenly you can no longer uh, account for it because all your local corrections just cannot be corrected anymore. Okay? Um, so you add small, some small mistakes in a way in which suddenly the whole thing breaks because you reach a crucial point and you can, there's no way to correct for this crucial point because you have done already so many local mis corrections. That's one, one way of explaining it. It's one way of thinking about it. It's one way in which we believe this is why this is the case. There's another reality, however, and I should have put the, the paper here, that is in many ways surprising, which is uh, if we only look at sequences and we forget about proteins, we just look at alphabets, then there will be a random probability to lose the signal as well. And that random probability happens somewhere here and actually is also a phase transition. So it's also a feature of sequences. Okay? We don't need to assume anything about a protein. Can I explain it in a strictly mathematical way? Where exactly the onset is, that's a different story. So the mathematical model does not really find this point exactly here. But in principle, this is also a feature of sequences.
Yeah. Um, are we explaining why the red line climbs so steeply above the blue line at the moment? Yeah, which effect is the point of a phase transition. Okay. Uh, that again is the curve shown here. Now in terms of cumulative uh, percentage, so it's a percentage accuracy, and so you go from sort of 100% to almost 0% in a very tiny interval, so that corresponds to something, you go from almost no mistake, 30% sequence identity to, to uh, 1 in 9 is right, or 9 in 10 are, are wrong, over 10 percentage points. So again, you, you, you can do from 100 to, say, to, to 30, you can go and nothing happens. And then you do another 10 and you suddenly completely lose the signal, right? And that's the phase transition here. And that's the, the, the observation that I try to explain. That is the problem behind sequence, or one of the major problems behind sequence alignments. Again, don't forget, since I have this increase in the blue, that's where I want to get. So we always try to go as far as possible here because that is where we can learn the maximal information. Not only because the probability is higher to find some protein that, for which I can look up the function, for which I can look up the structure. That is also increasing here simply because there are more da data points here. But it's also often true that in fact that is the most valuable information because it tells me most because those are the crucial variations. It's not only maintained the particular residue because evolution didn't have enough time. It is maintained just because it's functional. That's why it's so important to get into this. Okay? By the way, some people still use percentage sequence identity alone. If you used it alone, without sort of this length issue, then this is the curve you would get. Uh, so at some point, the, the good news, um, making mistakes and doing it right, at some point it converges. Um, but most of the time it doesn't. And again, many, many people still use that. This is really, really bad. Um, let's now look at the overall view. So that, what I showed you, is the view upon intruding the twilight zone going from safe to twilight. There is a view in which this essentially we can scale our system such that we don't make mistakes. Now let's look at it in a different view, the accuracy coverage, the specificity uh, versus selectivity, uh, overall view. So how many proteins do I find at my threshold? That's accuracy. How many proteins could I found that have similar structure if I just had gone far enough? Now on this scale, this is what we want. How close to it do you believe we are today in pairwise alignments? I think we're pretty close to that. Yes, we are. So again, this is the one we want up here, and this is the one that's the, the percentage sequence identity only idiot. Uh, this is BLAST. Well, you know, it depends really on your, on your definition of proximity, uh, whether this is pretty close to that. Uh, but you could also argue this has some su substantial difference. Uh, sort of the best way would be to use the Ross Smith Waterman score. That would be similar to the HSP curve, and that would be about here somewhere. The point is that the task of finding related structures is very tough. And pairwise alignments do not achieve this very well. They again, you, you can define the points where we uh, have 100% accuracy, and we find some here. The numbers are 10% of the best method. That is something. And that is the, the safe zone. That is somewhere over here. But really getting everything, pairwise alignments, no way. Uh, let's skip on that. Uh, what else could we do to improve the pairwise alignments? Without, so we're going to get into multiple alignments in a minute. But before that, what else could you do with pairwise to improve? Yeah? Include more information. Such as? Secondary structure, evolutionary information. Yeah, but that 
get in evolutionary information, no, because that's multiple alignment. Secondary structure information, yes, that would work. We get back into that. Yeah? Like domain information? Well, that's kind of multiple alignment. So again, mm, no, so again, my assumption here is we are actually aligning pair, uh, domains. So when wow. I talk about pair alignment, typically you try, in fact, uh, alignment methods work best if you begin with the evolutionary unit or the, the, the unit for the task that, that you pose, which is in fact, for instance, to identify similar structures. So typically that would be a structural domain. And that is my assumption. My, my question here is if I wanted to do better without going into multiple alignment, we all know multiple alignment will improve, what could I do short of using multiple alignments? Even use a three-dimensional structure. So you say that if I want to predict the similarity between structures, I use those two structures, and then after I know the solution, I will find a way to reproduce that in sequence. Is that is that what you're saying? Uh, I miss. I deliberately misused you. It's fun to talk to people. I, I enjoy this. Thank you. Uh, because that method is called threading, and I will actually talk about it. So twice you invented, or I don't know whether you knew about it, you invented things that I will talk about later. They exist, he, he is sort of right on. I just sort of misled him a little bit. No, that's not what I mean. What I mean is something else. Uh, think about what we did so far. Defining a f uh, value for the, s the alignment between two proteins implies I start with a protein and I actually define a circle around it. The circle around it is such that, for instance, if that is an HVAL of zero, then the accuracy, the expected accuracy is above 90%. Okay? I have three circles here, three proteins, A, B, C, and they are such that, in fact, I cannot infer their similarity within that circle of security. What could I do? To find something about a relation between them. Uh, in some sense, is similar to multiple alignment, but it's not. But just going pairwise alignments. Imagine you found X. X being within that circle of A. Meaning you can infer that X has the similar structure as A. X also being in the circle of B. You know that X has the structure of B. Huh. Right? So you now assume that A and B have similar structure. When you do that, distance from threshold here, you essentially stay totally up at 100%. When you find these pairs, and you don't make the mistake that we are actually looking at two different domains. So one issue could be that uh, the X has two domains. The first domain is aligned to A, the second is to B, uh, and then that would be a mistake. But as long as we talk single domains, that's where you get. Compare that to what you would get in the same area here, minus 10 to, to 5. At 5, you're at 100%, but then you drop to 10%. That stays up. So if you find these intermediate sequences, that's a very accurate way of doing it. The trouble with that, in fact, a couple of servers out there have been using that. The problem, again, is it takes a lot of time. So this type of method is, a pro is used when you, when you, when you the the alignment that you produce is very important for your career. There's a CASP competition I will talk about later where the goal is to predict structures and you can win a grant for that. And if you do things like that, then this is exactly the kind of things people do. But now we get into the multiple alignment issue. And the multiple alignment issue, the first one is simply, and I understand now that I should sort of present it differently, essentially what I'm talking about is extending the multiple alignment to a new dimensions. Here, this should be a 3D, a cube. Um, so same thing, but in 3D, the idea of dynamic programming for sequence comparison from Niedemann Wunsch comes from the 60s or 70s. This in 94, so relatively recently on the, on the scale of dynamic programming, it was proven that this in fact is an NP-complete problem. So you all know that means tough, tough, tough. Uh, there's a claim and I, somebody in the seminar presented that on Monday and I had not, had not heard about it. Uh, I don't, know, I don't have a reference and I don't have the time to look it up. But the claim is that there's a computer hack that now gets up to six 
sequences, so full dynamic probing on six, downside or upside, depending on how you look at it, you need 60 terabytes of mainframe memory. Uh, again, I'm unsure about this, but now what I owe you that I don't have now is that in fact most families in human, not, not most families in human, uh, most likely 95% of the families of the, in human would have families larger than 20. So this is nowhere near what we find in every day. So even if you happily could use 60 terabyte of memory, uh, this still would not get you there. Hacks to solve this, the first one comes from Lippmann. Uh, in fact, it's a dynamic program that does pairwise, but only things that are next to each other s somehow. But the hack that mostly, I guess, everybody in the group knows uh, is the one that started with Russ Doolittle, and that, in fact, is to map it to trees. So you do an all-at-once all for pairwise alignments, you compile the uh, pairwise sequence identity levels, you pick the first pair as the one that is the most similar one, you say that is blue and red, you align them. Uh, you pick the pair that is next most similar, say green and black, you align those, and then, in fact, you align pairs of pairs in this step. So now you have a sort of multiple alignment without ever doing anything other than pair alignments. You have a choice here, you could have done slightly differently in, in, this, in the second step. So you're doing this first, that is clear. You, it could be that in fact C is the next most similar because D and C well, okay, my numbers don't, don't, but it could have been that now the next most similar one here is really uh, C. In fact, C and B is, are very similar. It could be so that then, in fact, the next pair comparison would be green into that pair. So that is the choice you have. Uh, and that then, in the end, you align that to the black. This now, this way of doing it. There we get over to next week where we will talk about profile sequence alignments. So essentially this is like aligning the black one into the profile of those that is formed by those three. Again, uh, next week the second part of the alignments um, is written incorrectly and the uh, lecture here is un unsure. Thank you.